Uh, hey, well, welcome to Lakeway. It's always good when we're uh, a little bit comfortable. It's great when we have to move in three stacks of chairs. Uh, so we know that means that there's a lot of first-timers. Uh, if you are a first-time guest with us, we're so glad you're here. My name is Daniel. I get to serve as the pastor of this family that we call Lakeway. Uh, if you are a regular Lakeway uh, attender, well, it, it's been two weeks since I have been up here, which feels really weird. That's the longest I've gone in a year and a half. Uh, without being up here. So two weeks ago, Pastor Jerry was here. He did an incredible job. I watched it on the beach, on an elliptical in Destin, Florida, not to brag for those of you who are here. Uh, and then last week, we were on location uh, at the yard. So that was an awesome time if you were out there. We had a lot of great food and a great fellowship. Uh, and there on the tail end, for the first time in Lakeway's history, uh, I was speechless. So um, thank you. So for our folks who are new, uh, I was ordained at the United Methodist Church a few weeks ago, and this wonderful family uh, blessed me with a bunch of gifts. And it was, uh, like I say, I, I'm not often speechless. That shouldn't surprise you after I'm up here gabbing all the time. Uh, but I was truly and completely speechless. So uh, I just want to say again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, what I do is a lot of days the absolute best job in the entire world. I get invited uh, into really holy moments, really beautiful moments of people's lives. Uh, and then it seems like the very next day sometimes I feel like I have the hardest job in the world, uh, that I'm responding to something that I don't want to respond to, that uh, I'm, I'm feeling things that I shouldn't be feeling. It's a tough and beautiful job. Uh, and, and events like last Thursday, I'll, I'll look back on on those dark days and say, wow, God is good and my Lakeway family's good. Um, so thank you so much for the gifts. More than that, thank you for what the gifts meant uh, so there were four categories of gifts. Uh, one would have been more than enough, but there were four categories of gifts. I was actually surprised. Um, I, <laughs> I told Alex when I got home, I said, uh, when I realized that something was happening uh, was when Dave pulled out his camera and started recording Austin doing the announcements at the end. <laughs> and I thought, Austin's getting a lot better at the announcements, but I don't know if I would listen to that devotionally. I realized something's going on. So uh, there were four categories of gifts. It talked about uh, preaching and water and the sacraments and family. Uh, and I love the meaning behind those gifts almost probably more than I love the gifts themselves. Uh, I think it's a sense that I'm getting old now where I actually care about what people write in the cards. I'm not just looking for the amount on the check. And so I'm learning that gifts have so much meaning and that meaning behind the gifts meant so much to me. And if you don't believe the gifts have meaning, uh, buy your wife a treadmill. Right? For Father's Day, buy your dad or your husband a vacuum cleaner. Right? It, it may be a good gift, but there's a meaning behind it. And the reason I tell you that is because we're going to start a three-week sermon series tonight on the miracles. We're going to be in John chapter 2, by the way. You can follow along uh, on the Bible Notes app. There's instructions on your uh, little announcement card there. You can follow along there, or you can use the old-fashioned version like me. John chapter 2. But we're going to be looking at the miracles of Jesus. We're going to be a three-week sermon series. I'm going to talk tonight about Jesus turning water into wine. Uh, next week, the next two weeks, we might flip, we might not. Uh, Austin's got some family stuff to attend to, but Austin is going to preach his very first sermon at some point during this sermon series. Yes, so uh, we can clap for that. It's going to be great. It's going to be exciting. Um, He's going to be talking about the man born blind, and then we're going to follow it up after that with Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It's, there's seven miracles in the gospel according to John. We're going to cover three of them. But what I love about Jesus' miracles in the gospel of John is that John doesn't use the word miracles. He instead uses the word sign. He says these are the seven signs of Jesus. And the thing about a sign is it's not just about the object, but the sign points to something else. It's not just about the object that says stop or yield or exit. It's about what that sign means. And so what John's telling us in those very few word choices, he's saying, look, it's not just about what happens, but it's about what it points to. And so when we're going to look at these signs, these miracles in the gospel of John, we're going to be looking at the meaning behind the miracle. There's a lot of different ways to preach miracles. You've probably, if you've grown up in church, you've heard a lot of them. You can look at how Jesus is kind of flexing his supernatural muscles to do awesome things, and that's a great way to preach it. I've heard miracles preached as Jesus pointing us to the least, to the lost, to the lonely, to those people who need supernatural power, and then how we can be empowered to go out and serve people like Jesus did. That's a great message, too. But what I want us to do in these next three weeks is not just look at the storyline, but dig for deeper meaning within the miracle. And we're all trained to do this. 
right? If you have a good third grade English arts teacher, you know that the story is not just about the characters and the plot and the dialogue, that you're always looking for deeper meaning in things. I'm trying to go through the classics this year. I'm in the middle of Moby Dick. It's taken me a long time, uh, but I have to keep reminding myself it's not just about the whale. It'd be cool. I, I like fishing. It'd be a good story if it was just about the whale, but it's not just about the whale. And so we're taught from a very young age to search for meaning in the events that are happening. And so you, you think, you know, if you come home and uh, your husband has done the dishes, you could look at that and you could say, I, there's too many elbows going on here, folks. Be nice. <laughs> you could look at that and you could say, well, what a nice thing that they did. But really, women, I don't want to accuse you, but probably what's going on in the back of your mind is what does he want? Right? Your, your, your children, when they disobey you or when they come back with a bad report card, you're not just looking at that event, but you're asking, what does it mean? Think about national tragedies. Think about wars and natural disasters and terrorism. When those events occur, we're not just asking about the facts, the details of the matter, but we're asking, what does this all mean? And so when Jesus performs these miracles, we have to be careful not just to look at the story, but to look at the story underneath the story, to read in between the lines and see how Jesus is revealing who he is by what he does. When we read the Bible, it can sometimes get hard because it's an, it's an ancient text. It's a text in a different context, in a different culture that was written in a different language. And so sometimes we can just read the stories and we wonder, what's actually going on here? And so in this series, we're going to walk through it. I'm going to do some really in-depth textual work to show you what Jesus is actually showing us and to show you that everything Jesus does reveals something about who he is, which is not just true of Jesus, but it's true of all of us as well. What we do is, is a reflection of who we are. And so I hear oftentimes from young people, they're in a relationship and they say, well, yeah, she, she's a gossiper, and, 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 and yeah, she does that kind of stuff, but that's not really who she is. I know her deep down. Or they say, yeah, he gets angry sometimes. He punches holes in walls, but that's not really who he is. I wonder if that is who they are. Just a thought. I don't know. But everything that Jesus does reveals something about who he is because what we do discloses who we are. And so when we look at the miracles, we're going to be looking at what it reveals about who the person of Jesus Christ is. We're going to look at what the miracle reveals about who the person of Jesus Christ is. Because we love the miracles. And if you're not a Christian and you're not a believer and you're here tonight, we're so glad you're here. One thing that we can all agree on probably is that the miracles and Jesus' actions were good. Right? You pull a Buddhist and you pull an atheist and a Christian, and they all say, yeah, loving your enemy, that's a good way to live. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, being with the downcast people, all that stuff that Jesus did was really good. We can agree on that. But what we're going to see is that underneath the layers, Jesus is not just helping out the lowly. He's showing us who he is. He's revealing to us something about himself. That was the intro. I apologize. So I'm not even done with the intro. So what we're going to do uh, tonight, especially, is we're going to walk through mostly verse by verse. And I know I I've gotten feedback from some people. They say, hey, I don't like it when you preach that way. I don't preach that way all the time. But the reason I do it is because I think it's important for us to learn how to read the Bible together, uh, to see how all the different pieces fit in together. Part of my role as your pastor is to show you and to open the word to you and to give you a context so you can understand the text. I sped through that part of the introduction. John chapter 2. Verse 1 says this, On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So we get a lot of plot setting up right here. So we're told that there was a wedding at Cana. Cana would have been a small town uh, just outside of Nazareth where Jesus grew up. And so there's likely chance that he knew the people at this wedding. And this is the very first miracle, remember, that John gives us in his gospel. It's just in the second chapter, and it happens at a wedding. Which, when I started thinking about it, that's kind of a strange place to have a first miracle until you understand what a, wed what a wedding meant in this time. So it, these people who, who Jesus would have been attending the wedding of in this small town, uh, they were doing everything to get by. 
So they'd work two, three jobs just to put food on the table. They would do all that they could to provide, to scrape by, to pay the light bills, to pay the car bills, to just get by enough. And that was their entire life except for one period of time, and that was their wedding. So when a young man and a young woman would get married, this was the biggest event of their entire life. And what would happen is that they would throw not just a one-night wedding, not just a big party, but, but most weddings would last 7 to 14 days. And what would happen is that during these 7 to 14 days, the bride and the groom would be treated as a king and a queen. People would bow to them. They would, they would respect them and honor them as kings and queens. Whatever they say went. And then at the end of the 7 to 14 days, this has nothing to do with anything. I just found it interesting. At the end of the 7 to 14 days, they didn't have a honeymoon. Uh, instead, they would go back to their house, and it would be a week-long open house where people could just funnel in and out as much as they want to with the newlyweds right there. Sounds terrible. <laughs> but Jesus comes into the midst of this. Why? Because we're told that Mary, Jesus' mother, was invited to this wedding. Uh, later, scholars will say that likely Mary was probably related to one of the bridegroom, the bridegroom or the bride, bride, and so she was invited, and so that's why she's there. It's also uh, important to note that by this time, Jesus is about 30 years old. Uh, we haven't heard about Joseph, his father, since he was 12 years old, so a lot of people speculate that Joseph was probably uh, passed by now and that Jesus was sort of the man of the house. That'll provide an important clue here in a second. Verse 2. It says Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. So Jesus is invited because Mary's invited. Jesus rolls deep. And so about five disciples have showed up. And again, that's going to provide a problem a little bit later. So he rolls up to this party. And then something a little bit strange happens. First of all, we should say it's strange maybe that Jesus is at a party. I don't know what your vision of Jesus is. I, I grew up with kind of a vision of Jesus, uh, a lot like the, the old crusty people that I met at church growing up. None of you are old and crusty. This was a long time ago in a very different <laughs> church. But that's how we think of Jesus, right? We think, you know, in his three-piece suit, his tie button up, he knows when to stand in the service, he knows when to sit down, and he's very holy, and then he goes back home, and he prays, and he reads his scripture, and then he does it all over again. But here we're seeing Jesus chooses to show up at a party. Jesus is fun, right? This isn't like some high holy party. This is an actual, it's, it's a rager. <laughs> right? That's all I can use to describe it. So what this, uh, one commentator put it this way, he said, Jesus never counted it a crime to be happy. So why should his followers do so? Listen, if you're a Christian and you don't have that happiness and that joy, I wonder if you're doing Christianity wrong. And I wonder if the solution for you, this might be heretical, I wonder if the solution for you isn't to come to church more, but it's to go to parties more. <laughs> right? That's your life step for the week. Go to a party. <laughs> right? Now, let me, let me get practical here because, yes, as we're going to see, there is wine at this party. This is a rager. But if going to a party sparks some inclination to sin for you, then don't go. If you're worried that showing up at the party might end, you, end with you doing something you're not supposed to do, then don't go to that party. But if you're apprehensive about going to an event, a gathering, a party, because you wonder that those things that may be happening there might not be Christian enough for me, go to the stinking party. Jesus did it. Let's see what happens when Jesus gets to the party. Verse 3. When the wine ran out. Tongue twister. When the wine ran out. It should be an organ in the background. Dun, dun, dun. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. They have no wine. So I mentioned the wedding was the biggest event of somebody's life. What I didn't mention is what the customs were behind the wedding. The bridegroom, the, 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 the groom's family, would have been the one providing for this event. And to run out of wine would have been a, a social travesty. Remember, this is the biggest day of his life, and the groom who's supposed to provide doesn't. As the future father of now two daughters, uh, I wish we could go back to this custom, right? Why aren't the grooms still paying? I don't know. I don't get that. But the wine runs out. Have you ever run out of something? 
Maybe you've hosted an event, you didn't get enough food, you didn't get enough drinks. Think about that embarrassment that you felt. Maybe you threw a church cookout. <laughs> Maybe you didn't buy enough hamburgers last week. Maybe you sent your intern across the street to H-E-B, not very far, to go and buy more hamburgers, and maybe your intern then wrecked his truck. Just a hypothetical there. <laughs> so Mary runs up to Jesus, says, hey, we need more wine. Jesus says to her, woman, I'm going to stop right there. Jesus responds to his mother, Woman. Now, I read a lot of commentaries on this that some would say uh, this was a term of endearment, that he was saying, hey, sweet lady, hey, sweet mother of mine. Um, I'm not buying that, and we're going to see why here in a second. But let me also stop and say there's some teenager uh, minds churning here. Um, why can Jesus talk like this to his mama? Because he's Jesus, that's why. <laughs> right? This is not permission. Jesus says, woman. Now, why does he say woman? What does this have to do with me? And listen, he says, my hour has not yet come. If you read the Gospel of John, you'll see Jesus often talk about his hour. And that's referring to that moment that Jesus is going to die on a cross for our sins. He's so preoccupied with that hour that he knows is coming, that he has a hard time focusing on anything else. He knows it's a big deal to run out of wine, but he's so transfixed on his love for you and what he's going to do for you that he's kind of crass to his mama. But then I love this. In the very next verse, his mother, Mary, says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I think we all kind of want to invite Jesus to our party, but we start to get uncomfortable when he tells us what to do. We all want to say, yes, Jesus, come into my life. I want your miraculous power. I've got a lot of water. I'm looking for wine. Come on in. I need healing. But then the second that Jesus says, hey, I've laid out a path for you, and you're not walking on it, we balk. Don't balk if when you invite Jesus to the party of your life, he starts asking you, telling you what to do. Verse 6. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. Keep that in mind. And they each hold 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. This would have been uh, kind of the, the head waiter of the wedding. And so they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water that had now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, everyone serves a good wine first. When people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. Don't break out the box stuff. But you, you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of a sign Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and the disciples believed in him. So when you see wine in your Bible, that's generally always a sign of happiness, of joy. If there's wine in the land, then you know that when you're going to that land, there's going to be joy. It's a symbol for something else. It's a symbol for goodness. And so what Jesus does, he says, fill up those jars all the way to the brim. That's significant. So nobody could say, oh, they just dropped some wine in there. He says, fill it up all the way so nothing else can fit in there. And then he turns it into wine. Now, there, there's sort of the surface level that's a really good message to what's just happened. And the message is this, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. You might feel empty. You might feel like you're running out, but you have to be empty before you can be filled. And Jesus wants to come in and say, whatever you're worried about, whatever you feel like you're empty on, whatever you feel like you ran out of, Jesus says, I am enough. You think about it. If I asked you the question, what are you most worried of running out of right now? To 
depending on your stage of life, you're going to answer me in different ways. I, I would guess for a lot of us, uh, it's money. For some of us, it's energy. For some of us, quite honestly, it's patience. I'm worried about running out of patience. But if I pulled all of us deep down inside of us, what we're all scared of running out of is time and breath. And you're going to run out of time and breath. There's going to be a day that you breathe your last. But even in that, Jesus has said, I am enough. That last breath isn't your last breath, for you have an eternity if you are in me waiting for you on the other side. He says, fill up with my love and it will never run dry. He gives an overabundance. Six times 20 or 30 is over 180 gallons of wine. That's more than your Aunt Susie could take in a wedding night. I promise. <laughs> this is an overabundance. They would never be able to drink all of this wine in a wedding celebration, but Jesus is doing that to say, I'm not just going to fill you to the brim. I'm going to pour you to overflowing so that you might have so much joy inside of you that you overflow into others. That's the surface level of the miracle. So now let's get fun. There's two deeper levels of meaning here um, that I've saved to the end because they're the most exciting to me. So the first level of meaning here is to show that Jesus is in control of the natural order. Jesus is in control of the natural order. What do I mean by that? We as Christians believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man. And so we look at these miracles and we look at the stories of Jesus, and sometimes we say, I see a lot of man in Jesus. But we have to be reminded that Jesus is also fully God. And what does that mean? The same God who spoke the world into existence, the same God who is here at a wedding in tiny little Cana. And he has control over the natural order. He can turn water into wine, which no scientific discovery could ever do. They'd make millions of dollars if they could, but you can't. Just as Jesus was in control of the natural order then, he is still in control of the natural order now. What does that mean? It means very clearly, I believe that miracles happen today. I do. I believe them because I've seen them. I've seen families come together that should have never been in the same room without tearing each other's heads off. I have prayed over a man whose hospice nurse said he's not going to make it through the night, and then two weeks later, he's out working on his car. I have seen the miracles of God, and all a miracle is is when the kingdom of God overlaps with the earth and the kingdom of God wins every time. I have seen that overlapping of kingdom of God and earth happen. So don't tell me miracles don't happen. Don't tell me that your problem is too big. Don't tell me that your diagnosis is too strong. Don't tell me that your child is too far or that situation is unfixable. Don't tell me that. Tell me about your miracles. Tell me about the power of God working today just as he did at a wedding in the little old Cana. That's the first meaning. Here's the second one. Zach can come on up. The second meaning is this. So there's these two, there's these six stone water pots. And if you remember back to the earlier in the passage, it says these are for the rites of purification. What does that mean? That, that all goes back to the, the law of Moses, those 613 laws that God graciously gave to his people, the Israelites, so that they might have communion with him. So the story we tell as Christians is that Adam and Eve, the first humans, they had sin enter in. They sinned. They chose themselves instead of choosing God. And what did that mean? That meant that there was a, a, a break in the chasm. It meant that we as broken people couldn't have communion with God. And so God, in his great mercy, gives these laws that were really hard to follow, but they did the best they could. So these six jars would have been for purification. They would have had to feel clean before they could go to God. And so before the meal and in between each course of the meal, they would ceremonially wash their hands. They would do it from top to bottom and then bottom to top, and then they were clean. If they didn't do that, then they weren't clean, and they couldn't be in the presence of God. There were six of these jars. And the Bible numbers mean things. Seven is the number of perfection, of completion. Six is imperfection, incompletion. And so we're told there's six stone water pots, imperfection, incompletion. 
And that's what those people at the wedding thought that they were going to get clean by. They thought that if I just wash my hands with water, then I will be clean. But the miracle is this. Jesus comes in and says that old way of doing things, of trying as hard as you can to get to God, it's incomplete. It's not good enough. Instead of the water that they purified themselves with, Jesus fills that with wine and says, you don't need water. You need my blood of the new covenant, which means come to me, all you who are weary and labored, and I will give you rest. It's through his blood, through the wine, that we receive communion with God. And it all happens at a wedding. Throughout the scriptures, we see God depicted as the bridegroom, as the one who's reaching out to his people, to his creation, to those made in the image of him, saying, I love you. I want you. I want to be in relationship with you. You may be empty, but I will fill you. God, we thank you for...